Okay, uh, in this video I will briefly explain the structures we introduce on, uh, on the collection of all subsets of a given set and these structures will be helpful in studying the measures. So let's start with the set X and we generally will consider some collection of subsets which I will call S which we assume to be non-empty, so at least one element will be there. And we will put, we will, yes, we will require that this collection of subsets as satisfy a few properties, and in that case we will call it with a certain, certain title. So the first set of properties which I will require for the S is this one. If I have two elements, two subsets, which belong to S, then if I have that the intersection of these two belongs to the S and also I have that there is a finite number of elements of S which I call C1 and Cn such that the set difference is given by the disjoint union of these C's so if my collection of subsets S satisfy these two properties for any given two elements of S the intersection also an element of S and the set difference I don't require a set difference to be the element of S, but I do require that the set difference is represented as the disjoint union, finite disjoint union of some elements of S. In this case, the set S is called a semi-ring of subsets. That's the first terminology we have to remember. This is the smallest structure we will, we're going to be dealing with. Right, now just a few more definitions before we go. I oh, know. Actually, I'll give you just the examples of the of such structures. If if um, the set X is a real line, then the collection of all half open intervals like this is a very good example of a semi ring. I'll leave the, I'll leave it for you to check these properties, but that's certainly true, you can, you can make an effort and establish that. Uh, also, if x is the plane, rather than the line, is a plane, again, I'll leave it for you to check that the collection of all half-open rectangles will be a good example of a semi-ring. In fact, as it's a two canonical examples of a semi-ring, you have to keep in mind all the time. You can develop these examples to higher dimensions for the Three dimensional space, it will be half, half open parallelepipeds. For the higher dimension, for the dimension four and higher, it will be some structures of the same sort. All of them will be a kind of semi rings. Now, the next definition which I'd like you to know is that the set S will be called a ring if the following properties are true. For any two elements of S, Intersection will be element of S. Union of AB will be element of S. And set difference will also be the element of S. If these three properties, if these three properties hold, hold true, mm -hmm. if these three properties hold true, then a set, a collection S is called a ring of subsets. Again, I just emphasize this is no longer relevant. This piece is no longer... Of course, this is actually true. In fact, every semi-ring is a ring because, because uh, in case of a ring, the set difference is directly belongs to S. You don't have to make an effort and represent this set difference as a disjoint union of elements of S. It's just one single set difference. This by itself is an element of S. So, in fact, a ring is another, a ring of subsets is in fact a semi-ring of subsets. Now, for the ring of subsets, um, so for the collection of sets such that these three properties true, of course you can, for instance, the first two, you can develop them to the union or intersection of finitely many number of sets, not specifically two. So what I'm saying is that if I have if I have n different elements of my ring, if it is a ring, 
then then it will be true that it will be true that the um, that the union of this and sets which can be also shortly written like this also will be the element of s and similarly uh, the intersection of this n sets which can can be written like this also will be the element of this of the of the ring so in fact these two properties these two requirements for the ring they can be extended to the finitely many number of sets however it's not generally true that this can be extended to infinitely many number of sets if it can if you have infinitely many elements of your collection S, and that implies that the infinite union, or countable, in fact, union of these sets belongs to the set S as well. This kind of collections S, they deserve a different name, and in this case are called a sigma ring of subsets. Sigma, not just a ring of subsets, but a sigma ring of subsets. Obviously, every sigma ring is a ring. Now, on top of that, I have another few definitions, uh, just a few developments. If the, the whole set X belongs to the S, then a ring of subsets is in fact called an algebra of subsets. And if you have extra this extra property that the countable union of elements belongs to the element itself, Together with this, then the whole thing is called the, quite expectably, a sigma algebra of subsets. Sigma algebra of subsets. Yeah. So that's that's a diagram which explains to you, which explains to you this, a growing uh, uh, sequence of structures we will study. Uh, on the on this uh, on the subsets of a given set, so it is semi ring. That's the one which is given in the red box. Next goes a ring, which is these three properties, and the ring of course obviously is a semi ring. If you have this this extra property for the countable union, it is a sigma ring. If you extra throw in the complete set into your collection, then it becomes an algebra or a sigma algebra, depending whether you have this countable union property satisfied. I gave you I gave you the example of a semi of semi rings. Here we go, one here, one here. I'll give you a few examples of uh, rings. In fact, uh, the most interesting examples will come later, but you certainly can look at these rather trivial examples. Uh, the collection of one single set of empty set is a ring. Is a ring. In fact, it obviously will satisfy all these three properties. A collection of two sets, empty set and uh, the set X itself, it is obviously a ring and also an algebra. Or in fact, both of these actually in fact sigma, I mean the first one is in fact sigma ring, because countably, if you take countably many elements of this set, there isn't much of a choice for this, the union of those will be an element of this set. And the same goes about here, this is in fact sigma algebra. Uh, another rather trivial example is a collection of all subsets, which is again a sigma algebra. Uh, yeah. These three basically these are the trivial examples. Uh, we will they are good examples, but we will need the more advanced examples. And in order to build these more advanced examples, we need some preparation work. Now before we do that, I'll just on this slide I'll give you just a few extra pieces of information. One of them actually, I'll frame it as a lemma. If it says that if you have a ring, if you have a ring, then empty set will always be a member of that ring. 
The proof of that lemma is rather trivial. I'll leave it. Uh, I'll, I'll give you probably just if just a few guiding remarks. Uh, remember that a ring is something which is non-empty. So there is some element of your ring. If there is an element of your ring, then by the properties of the ring, uh, the element which is set difference of A with itself is also, which is by the way, empty set, must be an element of your ring. That's, that's all there is to the proof. Just one line of argument which proves that actually every ring must have an empty set in it. Now, more interesting lemma, again, the rather simple one, but still more interesting, says that actually if you have a collection of subsets of a given set X such that for any two, for any two, it is true that the union is in the set and the set difference is in the set, just these two, then R is a ring. Uh, if you compare this with the original definition, you will see that the intersection property is missing. So rather than requiring three properties, intersection, union, and set difference, we require only two. So in fact, the lemma says to us that these three properties, which I required originally in the definition, they are sort of excessive. You can reduce them down to these two and still end up with the, with the ring. The proof, again, is sort of one-line proof. It is based on the observation that actually if you intersect two sets, this is the same if you intersect it is the same as something like this. So you take the union, and then you set difference this bracket, which is set B, A, and B, and the set difference another this bracket. Establishing this identity should be done the way we done relations between the identities. I gave one example how we how uh, identities between sets should be established on the in the previous video. You should look at that and actually establish it. Uh, correct detailed proof or verification of this identity. It's a good exercise which I uh, require, well, I uh, strongly recommend you do. Now, if my, uh, if my collection R satisfies these properties, then look at this. This union must be the element of R, like this. This union must be the element of R, just because of the uh, because of the given properties. This bracket also the element of R. So this bracket also the element of R. Now the set difference of two elements of R is again the element of R. Again the element the element of R, again, this bracket, this bracket, again the element of R because B and A the elements of R and so the B, B set difference is also the element of R. So in fact these two properties is enough to establish that intersection will always be the element of R. And that's all because of this set identity. So this set ide this identity between these two sets at the, at the core of this proof. That's why I insist, uh, require, uh, recommend you try to check this identity independently.